three men. Uh, one of these, it says, is the Lord. Uh, and I've heard all kinds of explanations, but I'm just going to leave it at that because that's what it says. But he lifted up his eyes and he saw these three men coming. And so he went out and he met them and he welcomed them into his house and he ran in. He said, can I get you something to eat? And they said, okay. And so he ran in and told his wife to, to fix some cakes. He went out and picked a, a young calf and had his servants to slaughter it and cook it and get it ready. And <coughs> oh. And so he took the curds and the milk and the calf which had been prepared and he brought it out and, and gave it to them and they ate it. I find that interesting. Uh, it tells you it's in the culture in which he lived and the difference in our culture. Um, have you ever been in a restaurant and ordered something and it took a long time, maybe you ordered some fish and somebody says, I wonder if they had to go catch the fish. Or somebody says, I wonder if I had to kill the chickens uh, if you order fried chicken. Well, they literally did that. <laughs> he went out, went out in the pasture and got a calf and killed the calf and prepared the meat and uh, all of that uh, while these men were waiting to, uh, and he brought it to them to eat. And they asked him, where's your wife, Sarah? And he said, she's in the tent. And he said, well, uh, your wife will have a son this time next year. And Sarah was listening. She was standing at the door listening. And... Uh, it says that she laughed, uh, and they they said he they asked Abraham, said, "Why did your wife laugh?" And Sarah said, "I didn't laugh." And they said, "Oh yeah, you did. Said <laughs> you laughed, and said nothing is impossible or too hard for God. And when I come back, you will uh, have a child." And so the men arose from there and they started to leave. When they started to leave, uh, the Lord said. I don't need to hide from Abraham what I'm fixing to do. Sodom is an extremely wicked city and the cities that are around, are around it, Gomorrah and then some smaller cities as well. And he said, I'm going to destroy. And so he, he told Abraham, he said, he said, I'm going to go down. Uh, if you look at verse 19, it's what I referred to earlier. He says, I have chosen him, talking about Abraham, in order that he may command his children, his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice in order that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. Uh, that's the reason, reason God, God chose, chose Abraham, Abraham because, because he, knew he knew he would do, it, do it, what, what he would, he would do. do. Uh, but he but said, he said I, I, need I need to tell, tell Abraham, Abraham what I'm going to do. do. He said, because, because of the wickedness, wickedness that's there, there in Sodom, Sodom uh, I'm, I'm going to destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham said, said Lord, so, would you really sweep away the righteous with the wicked? That, that doesn't seem right. What, what, what if there's 50 people that are righteous in the city of Sodom? Would you spare the city then? And, and the Lord said, yes. He said, for 50 righteous, I'll spare the city. Abraham said, well, I've already, I've already talked to you about this. And, and, and just, you know, forgive me, but how about 45? Well, the Lord said, okay, for 45, I'll spare the city. He said, well, just one more time. What about 40? He said, for 40, I'll spare the city. And so Abraham keeps apologizing and keeps asking. He says, what about 30? And the Lord said, okay. He said, what about 20? He said, okay. He said, what about 10? He said, for 10 righteous people, I'll spare the city. That shows us a lot about the mercy of the Lord. Uh, as well as the relationship that Abraham had with God. Uh, but it, it tells us a lot about the mercy of the Lord. And he said, for ten righteous people, I'll spare the city. And so it says, as soon as they finished speaking, the, these men disappeared. They left. Abraham returned to his place. Well, the men went down to Sodom. And we talked about last week that Lot had moved toward what? Toward Sodom, the green pastures and plains down by the river close to Sodom, and he had moved down in that direction toward Sodom. Now we see Lot again, and he's in Sodom. And not only is he in Sodom, but his daughters are engaged to, to men that live in Sodom, and they're all wicked. And so these men come in, and Lot sees them when they come into town, and he invites them to come into his house. And this just describes how wicked... Sodom had become, 
And it says, The men of the city surrounded Lot's house and said, Send these men out to us that we may lie with them. And, and Lot said, Don't do such a terrible thing. He said, I've got two daughters. I'll give you my daughters. Uh, and you can do whatever you want to, but please don't do this because these men have come under my roof and they're under my protection. And it says they begin to press against Lot uh, and we're going to take him. And the men, these angels reached out uh, and grabbed Lot and pulled him inside and closed the door. And then they struck the men of Sodom blind uh, so that they were groping around and couldn't even find the door. And so early the next morning, they told Lot, said, is there anybody else in this town that belongs to you, any family? Uh, and he said, I have two son-in-laws, and actually they were, it seems they were not married yet, but they were going to be his son-in-laws. And Lot went to them and explained to them what God was going to do. And he said that, that, they, that he seemed to them as someone who was jesting. Uh, they just made fun of him. And so Lot went back, and these uh, men from the Lord took Lot and his daughters and his wife by their hands and led them out of the city, said, we've got to go because we're fixing to destroy this city. Uh, you need to flee to the mountains. And Lot said, well, how about if I go to this city over there? There's a small town. And they said, okay, you can go to that small town. Uh, and so they fled. Uh, and then as they were getting there and the sun started coming up, uh, God rained fire and brimstone out of heaven and completely burned and destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. As they were fleeing, Lot's wife looked back, and they had been told, don't look back. And she looked back, and she turned to a pillar of salt. My personal thinking is that looking back was more than just turning around and physically looking back. I think the idea of don't look back is don't look back with the idea... You remember, you remember how the Israelites, later on when we get to there, and, and Matt talked about this in one of his classes, but you remember how the Israelites complained about the food and complained about the water and complained about everything else, and they said, oh, that we were back in Egypt, but we, we should have stayed in Egypt. We're going to die out in the wilderness. We're going to die at the hand of the enemies. We should have stayed back. That's what I think looking back refers to as well as physically looking back, but it's the idea of longing to be back there. And I think Lot's wife was looking back because she didn't really want to leave. And that's just my thinking. It doesn't specifically say that. Uh, but because she looked back and God said, don't look back, she turned into a pillar of salt. And so she died. Uh, when they got away, they left the town uh, very soon after that and went up into the mountains and lived in a cave. And so it was just Lot and his two daughters living in a cave. The two daughters began talking and they said, we're uh, not going to have any kids and there's no way for us to have kids because we're not going to be able to meet a man living in a cave. Uh, and, and so they came up with this plan and they got Lot uh, drunk and the oldest one went in uh, to her father uh, and, and then one night and then the next night the second one did. They both were pregnant by their father. Uh, the oldest one had... Uh, a son named Moab. And when we study about the Moabites, this is the son, comes from the son of Lot. So when you study about the Moabites, you know where they came from now, uh, if you didn't know already. The other one, the second daughter had a, a son. She named him ben -Ami, and he was the father of the Ammonites. And so uh, the Moabites and the Ammonites are descendants of Lot. Uh, and we study a whole lot in the Old Testament about both of those nations, uh, Moabites and Ammonites. Uh, uh, let me see where I am. I hadn't been looking at my notes, and I, I don't know where I am in my notes. I was just looking to see. Okay. That's, that's everything I had on chapter 19. Any questions down through chapter 19? I don't plan to go chapter by chapter through the whole Old Testament. I just, with Abraham, it's so many different stories to tell, and they all involve things that are related to things that happen later, pretty much. And so 
I want to pretty much cover the life of Abraham in this way, but some of the others we will abbreviate much more than we're doing Abraham. Um, in chapter 20, Abraham left and went to what's called the Negev, which is uh, down in the, the sort of southern part over uh, toward the, the sea, which would, or down toward Egypt, which would be over uh, where the Philistines end up being uh, also. Uh, but he, he goes there uh, and settled, it says, between Kadesh and Shur, and then he sojourned in Gerar. Uh, Abraham told his wife Sarah, said, I want you to tell people that you're my sister so that they won't take you uh, and, and kill me uh, and take you as their wife. Uh, I was amazed that that happened when she was 65 years old. Now she's 90-something years old. Or 90. She's 89 at this point. So she's 89 years old, and he's still worried about her. She's so good-looking. Uh, but uh, Abimelech was the king there. And Abimelech took Sarah. And God began to send plague on Abimelech. And then God appeared to Abimelech and told him, uh, he said, basically, he said, you're a dead man because you've taken somebody else's wife. And he said, I did it in innocence. I didn't know it. Uh, he told me it was his sister, and I had no idea that this was, that this was his wife. And God said, that's the reason I appeared to you and warned you because I knew that you knew you didn't know that. Uh, and I wanted you to have an opportunity to do something about it. He said, if you will go to Abraham and restore his wife to him and, and ask him to pray for you, uh, then it will take away all of this. And so Abimelech went to Abraham and he says, what's this you've done to me? What evil have I done to you? He said, you could have had me killed and my whole family killed by doing what you did. Uh, he said, Here, take your wife. And he gave her basically a dowry uh, promise or a, a money stuff to, to pay for the damages that had been done and, and gave back uh, Sarah to Abraham and said, Now get away. Don't, don't stay here. And, and so Abraham prayed for him. And it says that uh, God had stopped the wounds of, of the wombs of all the women under Abimelech. And so the Lord uh, restored them. Uh, to their health. Uh, and he, Abraham said, uh, he said, actually she is my sister because uh, we had the same uh, father but different mothers. Uh, and so Abraham prayed God and God healed Abimelech, his wife and his maids so that they bore children. And then chapter 21, the Lord took note of Abraham and Sarah and the promise that he had made. Uh, he had not forgotten it. <laughs> but it just says, says, I think when he says he took note of it, he realized God is saying, okay, I promised this time and now it's time. And, and so he's just carrying out the fulfillment of what he had promised them. Uh, and so Sarah did conceive. She bore a son to Abraham in her old age. Uh, he was a uh, hundred years old, and she was ninety years old, uh, and you can imagine the joy that they had. Their life was wrapped up in Isaac. Isaac was he was he was their life. As the child grew, uh, came time for the the child to be weaned, and they always had this big celebration as part of their culture, the weaning of the child, and and so when they did that. Ishmael, they saw Ishmael, or Sarah did, saw Ishmael, and he, he was making fun of Isaac. And Ishmael was, uh, I believe, 13 at this time. Uh, and so he was making fun of, of Isaac, and it, it really distressed Sarah. And so she told Abraham, she said, i got to do something. He said, it's up to you. It's your maid. You do what you want to. And so he sent her away. So Hagar took Ishmael, and they... They started on a journey, not really knowing where they were going, just, just going. Uh, they finally ran out of water, uh, and there was none around. And apparently they'd been out for a while because uh, it says that they were about to die. And so Hagar 
put her son under a tree and then she went about a bow shot away from there uh, to wait on him to die. Uh, and I mean, we're talking about a 13 year old boy so he obviously was pretty famished uh, at this point for her to have been able to even do that. Uh, and, and the Lord appeared to Hagar and said, what are you doing here? said, uh, you need to get up. And he showed her some water and uh, said, I'm going to make a great nation of people out of Ishmael. Uh, and said, uh, you just, you go ahead and, and you drink water and get up and go. And so uh, they did. Uh, Abimelech came to Abraham, uh, back to Abraham and said, we need to make a, a covenant between us and, and between my descendants and your descendants that will be good to each other. And Abraham said, that's fine. And, and then Abraham said, Abraham said, well, what about the whales? And Abimelech said, what whales? And he said, every time we dig a whale, your men take it away from us. And, and this is my whale. And Abimelech said, okay, it's your whale. You have it. And, uh, so they made a covenant and, uh, in, at Beersheba and Abimelech and uh, Abram uh, planted a tree there uh, to call on the name of the Lord. Uh, and he stayed in the land of the Philistines, it says, for many days. All right, any questions down through there, comments? As I said, Abraham and Sarah were totally wrapped up in this kid. If you can imagine having lived 90 and 100 years and not had this son, but having been promised for the last 30 years, basically, that they were going to, finally this son is born. And you can imagine what it would have been like uh, and how much they this was their life. Uh, a lot was, I mean, uh, Isaac was his name. Isaac was somewhere around 12 years old. And one, one day God told Abraham, he said, I want you to take Isaac, your son, and carry him over to, to Mount Moriah. And I want you to offer him up as a sacrifice. When I read that, I immediately can think of about a thousand reasons I probably would have given God why that's not a good idea. Uh, I mean, after all, you promised that He's going to be a great nation of people. I, I know you don't like human sacrifices, and, and you know, and I could just keep going with all these reasons why uh, this is not a good idea, but there's no indication that Abraham even protested at all. There's absolutely none. In fact, it says early the next morning he got up and he took Isaac, he took some of his servants with him and they got some wood and they put it on the animals. Uh, they took some fire and a pan and, and they started out. And it was a three-day journey for them to go. I've had a lot of times, I've had people that are about to have surgery that have told me, I wish I could just have it today because the waiting is horrible. Uh, the anticipation is not good. You know, let's get it over with. Can you imagine what it was like for three days for Abraham as he's journeying over toward Mount, Mount Moriah? And finally they get to the foot of the mountain and he tells the servants, you stay here with the animals. He takes the wood and he gives it to Isaac and he says, you carry this wood up the mountain. And Abraham's carrying the fire and the knife. And as they start up the mountain somewhere along the way, Isaac looks at his daddy and he says, he says, Father, here's the wood and there's the fire, but where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, God will provide. And when they got up to the top of the mountain, they built the altar and then Abraham took Isaac and tied him up and put him on that altar on top of the wood. He took the knife and he drew his hand back and he was just fixing to kill his son. And God stopped him. And said, I know now that 
you, if you will not withhold your son, your only son from me, that you'll do anything I ask you to do. And so he looked around and there was a ram caught in the thicket behind him. And he took the ram, took Isaac off of the altar, untied him, took the ram and killed it and put it on the altar and offered up the sacrifice with the ram. When you read Hebrews 11, it really explains how Abraham could rationalize in his mind what he was doing was going to turn out okay. What had God promised him? Okay. He had promised him that through his son would be a great nation of people. Now Isaac's 12 years old and he obviously doesn't have any kids so this can't happen yet. So he says, you're going to have this great nation of people. Abraham says, what about through Eliezer, my servant? God says, nope, it's going to be through your son born to Sarah. He says, what about Ishmael? He says, nope, it's not going to be him. It's going to be through your son born to Sarah, through Isaac. So God has promised him repeatedly that not just through one of his children, but through Isaac, he will become a great nation of people. Now, if Abraham kills Isaac and God keeps his promise What's God got to do? Raise him from the dead. He'd have to. And and, and Abraham understood that. He said, I can kill him, but God will bring him back to life. And so in Hebrews 11, it says that Abraham offered his son Isaac on the altar. Now in Genesis, he didn't go all the way through with it. If you only read in Hebrews, you'd think he actually went all the way through with it and killed him. But the fact is, in his mind, he did. He, he wasn't withholding anything. He was, going, he was going through with it completely, and God stopped him. So we see here a tremendous amount of faith. And, and Abraham reasoned like this. If my wife is past the age of bearing children and she can't have any kids, but God can give her a child. And basically then, He has given us life through one that is dead. As far as bearing children, Sarah was dead. And God gave life through her. If God can do that, then He can raise Isaac from the dead if I kill him. And so it was this reasoning that Abraham was using that that bolstered his faith that God would do it. And it was based on the fact that God's Word is sure. God will do what God said He would do. And so he never doubted what God would do. The only thing he had to do is just say, okay, in my mind, how can I rationalize this to make, make this horrible thing fit what God wants? And he was able to do that by trusting in God. And so I, I, of all the stories in the Old Testament, To me, this is one of the greatest examples of faith that we have. There's about two or three different occasions that it says that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Uh, And he was counted righteous because of his tremendous faith in God. And we need to be, we need to have that same kind of faith in God ourselves. Yes. Yeah, I've, I've wondered about that. I'm going to tell you one thing this did for Isaac. Number one, he's, he's young enough that, that he probably, he didn't know what was going on until it was too late for him to do anything about it. He might could have run if Abraham had told him sooner what he was going to do. Uh, but but he, Abraham tied him up, you know, and then put him on the altar. So he, he, he was helpless. But I believe that this probably Taught, Abra- taught Isaac a lesson that he never forgot. Trust God and God will take care of you. And if, if anybody learned that lesson, Isaac did. Uh, that's a good point. I'm glad you mentioned that. All right. Anything else on? One thing you know about Isaac, well, Abraham too, is he offered his son Isaac as a sacrifice for the Yeah. And at the age of 12, 
well he's able to recognize what they're doing and where they're going and a little bit about it. Right. And so how are we as far as with our kids, they well we got the Bibles and we got the car, well where are we going to church or where yeah. you know they're they're picking up things and they understand things a lot a lot sooner than we give them credit for. You're absolutely right, and, and, and I'm sure that, that as we have seen, wherever Abraham went, he built an altar. And I, I feel, and I'm sure he used it regularly once it was built. And so I feel sure that, that what you're saying is absolutely true. Isaac had seen Abraham offer up a lot of sacrifices, I, I'm sure. Uh, and, and he knew, he was familiar with, with worshiping God. And, and, and so he, that was something. Yes, and that's a good point because we need to, we need to make sure that our children are familiar with worshiping God. That that's a, just something we do. I don't think Lot would, I don't think, well, I keep saying Lot, I don't think Isaac would ever have questioned whether or not Abraham would worship God when he was supposed to because he always did. Uh, and and the, our, our example should be that kind of example for our kids as well. All right, anything else? And, and I think part of that is the fact of their age, but I think that they were able to reason through it and think about it. I think another part of it, too, is that both of these, Jesus at the age of 12 and, and, and Isaac at the age of 12, both of them had been in families and situations where they were taught about God. Uh, and so it, it had sunk in. They were old enough to reason through it and, and recognize their need for God. And, yeah, and I think that I think that's good logic what you're saying that, that a lot of kids by the time they're 12 are, are old enough. Yeah. 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 There's exceptions both ways but that, as a general rule I think that's probably right. Okay. Alright, anything else? Alright. In the book of Romans, Paul uses Abraham as an example of faith and he says that because of his faith he was counted as being righteous and he said so if we have that kind of faith and the faith of Abraham then we can be counted righteous as well. And he goes on and explains that that, that kind of faith is the faith that would cause us to respond to Jesus Christ, to respond to his 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 call for us to become a Christian. And we talked about the fact that the purpose of the Bible is to show the Redeemer. And we all need redemption because all have sinned. And we need to, excuse me, we need to come to God and have our sins forgiven. And there may be some that are here tonight that have never done that, that are ready to do that. And they're ready to give your life to God and, and to become a child of God. And we want to encourage you to, to think about that and and whether it's tonight or if you want to contact us some other time, we certainly would encourage that. Or, or if, if you're watching over the Internet and you know that you need to become a Christian, if you want to contact us, we'll be glad to meet with you and, and, and talk to you about that as well. And If you believe that Jesus really is the Christ and you're willing to confess your faith in Him, turn away from sin, you can be baptized into Christ 
have your sins forgiven. We're going to sing number 781 first and the last verses. If you're subject to the invitation, we invite you to come as we stand and sing. Wonderful story of love and to me again. Wonderful story of love. just say right quick that I fully intended to sing some songs for the young people night and I forgot it. Sometimes I forget stuff. I get started on my lesson have a one track mind. That's, I forgot all about it. Uh, we'll sing maybe next week we can sing it. Well, we won't do it next week because we've got a meeting next week. But maybe after that we'll sing some extra ones. Remember Sunday, uh, Brother Wilson Adams will be here for our uh, 10 o'clock service. And speak to us. He will be here for our 11:15 service. He will speak to us then. He will be back for what's normally a Bible class for another worship service at five o'clock Sunday evening, and speak to us at that time. We will not be having services on Monday and Tuesday, but then on Wednesday night, uh, as we did tonight, we will meet again at seven o'clock. Brother Adams will be speaking to us then. Yes. Uh, Robert, I've had a couple answers. Uh, Brother Adams is going to have a different sermon for the. 10 o'clock versus 11 15. I'm sure that we yes, Every service will be just like a new one. We have kept it split just so we can keep our crowds down and maintain social distancing. But it will be different lessons. So if you come to one and don't get to see the other one immediately, you need to look at it later on on the internet. Okay. okay. Yeah, if you're not here for the 10 o'clock, uh, and you are here for the 11, you can watch the 10 before you come. If, you, if you're here for the 10, you're not 11. When you get home, you can watch the 11, 11, 15 service. So, uh, yeah, there will be different lessons. So uh, just like we have, have been doing, it's, uh, as Joel said, is to keep the crowd smaller so we can have the social distancing is the reason for, for leaving it like we're doing it this time. Are there any other announcements? We need to remember those that were mentioned as being sick and uh, continue to pray for them. Um, Adam, would you lead us in closing prayer, please?
Father, we're so thankful for your, you sending your son to die on the cross for our sins, and we pray that you will forgive us of our sins, because we've sinned so very much. In your son's most high and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. There was a Lucas update. 